Okay, now I'm back to actually being able to see what you're seeing as opposed to trying to go from memory. So, um, one, a couple other things about the ducks and the geese and the swans is that they can be found when I said in aquatic habitats, anything that is aquatic from marshes through freshwater areas, through saltwater marshes um, to places that are seasonally wet. In places that are grasslands part of the year and, and swamps part of the rest of the year. But a few of them are found exclusively in forested areas. These birds tend not to do well on beaches because they're outcompeted by gulls and sandpipers and those types of birds. So those are the types of aquatic habitats you would not find them in. And ducks and geese and swans have a lot of unusual taxa. So there's a lot of birds that fall into this grouping that are different from the average or that may not seem to work well. Um, it's a pretty complex group, taxonomically speaking, and we've tried to divide stuff to the best of our abilities, but there may still be some changes. One of the things is that um, there are some species that are entirely found on islands, and there are some that are widespread geographically and found just about everywhere. So the ones that are geographically widespread, you have to figure out, is it a single species? Are there multiple species? The ones that evolve on islands are very, very, very different from just about anything else. So we do see differences based on geography and evolution. And because of this, different field guides will classify some as having multiple species, whereas other field guides will say one species. The plumage uh, of the young is used along with courtship displays, anatomy, and genetics in trying to determine classification. And because these birds hybridize remarkably well, classification can be more interesting when you have some hybrids in an area. And there are three subfamilies, the Dendrocygnidae, the Anserinidae, and the Antinae, which this last one, has a whole bunch of tribes underneath of it. So apparently tribes are not what you're used to thinking about with taxonomy, but we do have that here with, with these birds. And um, why do you think as people we care about the birds that fall in this group? Ducks, swans, and geese. Why might they be important to us? Um. The water, because the water, like animals, it, they're more like to keep track of how the, you know, the ponds and the river. So they can help us maybe with figuring out environmental health of aquatic systems. They're used as um, food sources in the They're food sources. Either the birds or the eggs can be food sources. And wild or domesticated, right? because there is there are, um, wild hunts of ducks and geese, but some people will keep geese on their farms. And there's another reason that you might not automatically think of, but the use of feathers for fashion. Um, it's They were used a lot in hats, but also the use of feathers for down comforters and down pillows and that type of thing. So we are using these animals perhaps more than we use a lot of other birds. Our first group is the whistling duck. This is that Dendrocygnae group. They are very different than a lot of the other ducks. They actually look like what would happen if you crossed a goose with a duck. They have the coloring of a duck, as you can see here but they have the body structure of a goose. So if you want to think of it as a very large looking duck, that would kind of be what we would describe this group as. They tend to live in warm temperature areas to even tropical areas. And the males and the females, they're similar in color and size. So we see no difference here between those group. We have the fulvous whistling duck and there's also a black bellied whistling duck. The Ancinone. This is going to be a group where we do have sexual differences in both size and in voice. 
So the males and the females will have very different types of vocal signals. Within this group, there's no sexual difference when it comes to plumage. So the males and females look the same, they just sound a little bit different from each other. The um, Anserini are the geese. They're well adapted to cold weather. Many of them spend a considerable amount of time in Canada in the North American groups. So they do very well in cold. And six species will breed in North America. Can anyone name some geese that breed in North America? The snow goose? Canada geese. The Canada goose. They do breed here. Um, there's this anecdotal story of how the, the Canada geese ended up here. I don't know that it's true. I don't think that it's true, but um, it could be. At one point in time, um, they were much more migratory than they are. So Canada geese were not year-round residents in areas like this. They would be here for maybe the winter, maybe part of the spring, but then they would fly up to Canada, or at least the majority of the group did this. Some are still migratory, but as you all can tell me, the geese are no longer always migratory, right? We see them year-round. Um, we've done a really good job recently of I here moving them over to Cabrini's campus, and we have less. And we've also moved them down the road to Radnor High School. Have any of you driven by Radnor High School in the mornings when the one field is filled with geese? Like there's like upwards of 50 of them some mornings when I drive by. But how do we think they got here? Well, there's this story that a couple in Maryland decided the wife really loved the Canada geese. And she was complaining to her husband that she hated when they flew away. So he caught a couple pairs and he clipped their wings and they had a pond in their backyard and the geese now had clipped wings so they couldn't migrate and they stayed on her pond year round. And geese, you can decide whether this is smart or stupid, tend to go, oh, hey, they're staying there all the time. That probably means I can stay there all the time too. Um, so they perhaps fall victim to peer pressure and other geese started showing up at areas nearby there and then staying within the mid-atlantic and other regions year-round because they learned to either stay there because other geese were or they learned that they no longer had to migrate because they could withstand both the warm and the cool seasons of this region like i said i don't know whether or not it's true but i do know from what i've read that canada geese used to be more migratory as a group than they are today I really hate to think of the idea of one woman's wish for a couple captive pair of Canada geese as being the reason why we have so many of them. Because from a human impact on nature standpoint, that's terrifying. Um, for the swan, it's the Cygni. We have seven species worldwide. It's only seven species of swans. Two regularly breed in North America and two are known to occur in North America, but they tend to be Asian or European in their distribution. Swans compared to geese have a much longer neck. You can kind of see that from there and there. And that neck difference is related to how they feed. So the swans are gonna be feeding more from the bottom of the water column than the geese will be. These birds tend to mate for life and they are herbivores. And then moving on to the true ducks. These are going to be the group where you see different plumage. So the plumage is dichromatic, meaning that the males and the females are going to have different styles of plumage. And for the males, it varies, diff it varies based on season. During the breeding season, the males have very bright colors. During the non-breeding season, the males are very dull looking. They have... <coughs> Sorry. Um, they will actually adopt a plumage that's very, very similar to the females during their non-breeding times. This protects them because a male with a lot of bright plumage could easily become a victim of another animal looking for a food supply. In the breeding season, though, the male with the really bright plumage, he's going to get a female to have babies with. So the evolutionary history has this bright plumage color which makes you more attractive to the females, being balanced against not being too bright, 
that where you're obvious and you get eaten all the time. So there is this evolutionary kind of balance between those two characteristics, which is why we think they have a season when they're not breeding, where they have this brown tonation. And with ducks, they are not monogamous. They will form new pairs each year, generally on their wintering grounds, and then return as a pair to their breeding grounds. Within the ducks, there are many, many tribes. Uh, the first are your dabbling ducks. These are the more common ducks that you're probably used to that are going to feed from the surface. So they dip their beaks into the water. They use the beaks to move the water around to filter out the food that they want to eat. This is your mallard. It would be the best example that we can give you of one of these. Their males are brightly colored. Their females all tend to be brown. And as a matter of fact, it is sometimes hard to determine what female of what species you are looking at because the female mallards, the female blue wing and gray wing teals, and all the rest may look similar. And when all the birds are together in a group, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to tell the females apart from each other. There are about 50 species worldwide and 12 that breed in North America. And they feed by straining water through their beak. Their beak has structures that we'll see in a bit called the mele that um, are like filter feeding apparatus that you would see in other organisms. Um, they will upend their bodies with their tails sticking out of the water when they're feeding from the bottom. And they're also known to pick up food with their bill, but specifically for pulling seeds off of vegetation using the edge of the bill with the lamellae where it's a little bit sharper than it is the rest of the bill. So it's the mallard, the northern pintail, the teals, the wood duck, all of these fall under that dabbling duck category. Also, um, it includes the Muscovy duck with the wood duck that are tree cavity nesting birds. So the tree and the Muscovy will nest in a tree, whereas the rest of your ducks nest where? On the ground. Is it interesting to think of ducks nesting in trees? Not what you might expect. They will change their diet with the season. So before they molt or change feathers, they eat a lot of invertebrates. We believe this is to help them get the necessary nutrients to create more feathers. When they're breeding, they also eat a lot of invertebrates. In part, this helps the female duck be able to create enough eggs um, and have enough minerals to secrete that egg coating uh, when she's laying eggs. But the rest of the year, they eat herbivore foods, so plant matter and seeds but they do have that switch to insects before molting and breeding times. And then we have the bay ducks. There's 15 of these. There are five species that will breed in North America. They are sometimes called the scalps. It's S-C-A-U-P-S. -S. Um, and the tufted duck is one species that doesn't breed here, but it does show up here. These birds are very different in the bill than the dabbling ducks. So the dabbling ducks are going to feed at the surface, but these birds are going to dive for their feeding. So instead of just upending their butt the way the mallard does, where it just kind of flips itself with the butt sticking out of the water, these birds will actually dive. And because of this, their beaks tend to be shorter and they're rounder and their bodies tend to be um, plumper, perhaps because they have a lot more musculature for the diving structures than the dabbling ducks do. They also tend to have very simple color patterns, whereas the dabbling ducks tend to have colors that are all mixed together or there tend to be stripes, whereas this is a red body or a red head, a white and black body. And this one is a canvas back, which is not to be confused with a lot of the other ducks that look similar to this within this grouping. And you have the sea ducks or the mergansers. They're beautiful. If we're lucky, we will get to see a couple of these at um, Heinz. We've seen them there before. There's only 19 species, but 15 of these 19 breed in North America. So this is predominantly a North American group. The Labrador duck, which is now extinct, was part of this group. We'll talk about him at the end. Um, and they have a lot of heavy down feathers. So this makes them ideal for living in cold climates. 
and they tend to eat animal foods. So they will eat things that are more animal in nature rather than plant in nature. These birds will dive. They tolerate salt water better than most other birds. And they're gonna include um, the eiders, the scooters, and the golden eyes within this group as things other than the mergansers. So it's an interesting group with a variety of names, none of which have the word duck as part of them, even though these are ducks. And finally, we have the stiff tails, called stiff tails because their tail stands up. If you see one of these, it should be obvious that you have seen a stiff tail. There are only two species in North America, the ruddy duck and the masked duck. What do you notice about this duck that is different than any other duck you've ever seen other than the tail? Blue beak. This is seen in the male ruddy ducks in and around breeding season. If we are very, very lucky or blessed or whatever you would like to call it, we will see a male ruddy duck with a blue beak at Heinz. I have seen them almost every time that I've been there, so hopefully we will get to do the same um, because who doesn't want to see a duck with a blue beak, right? And it's a very obvious identifier when you see it. If the beak is blue, it is obviously a ruddy duck. But these birds have a problem. Because they have this long tail that sticks upright um, and their bodies are a little bit heavier than other ducks, their feet are placed further back on the body. So instead of perhaps being here, feet are back here. That means on land, they're not very good at walking. So they do very well in water, but they're not good at walking on land because their feet are not under what would be their center of gravity. Variations. Um, there's 11 subspecies of Canada goose. Their subspecies so far have been characterized based on size. There are geographic separations in the variations of this group where we have subspecies or we have things that don't quite count as a subspecies yet, but it's a variation on the species. There's a lot of them. It makes identification difficult, which is one of the reasons why you have Eastern North American field guides or at least North American field guides because what we'll find here may have different variation than what would be found elsewhere. Uh, the snow goose has color morphs, so there's a white version of the snow goose, and there is a blue or grayish version. The um, snow goose, we actually thought at one point were totally different species because their colors look nothing alike. The tundra swan, we thought there were two different species at one point, one in North America, one in Europe and Asia, but we now realize that that probably wasn't true and genetically they're almost identical, if not identical. So they can interbreed and that there are crossovers between them. We're using that idea now to look at the ducks that are found widespread like that to determine whether or not they're different species. And hybrids happen. We've had them on campus. They occur a lot in captivity where ducks and geese and other things are kept together and there's not enough of their group to mate with, they'll mate with whatever's available. Some of these hybrids will escape, and some of them just happen in nature, and some of them are fertile. I mentioned last week that sometimes you can have two different hybrids that then mate with each other, and it gets really confusing to figure out what hybrids are. So if you see something that looks like a duck but none of the ducks in your field guide, it's probably a hybrid. So molting and plumage. So molting is going to be that periodic replacement of feathers and plumage is the feathers. We do see that there is some sexual difference in most North American species, at least of the ducks. This is not true of the swans and the geese, but there aren't as many of them. So for the majority of the family, this is true. Um, they're actually so different that at some points the males and the females were identified as separate species. And then we realized that, wait, that species always mates with that species because the male and the female are not separate species. It's taken us a while to figure out how that works. And if you happen to find 
you won't at this season of the year, but if it was the spring and you happened to find a chick, good luck figuring out what species it is because many of them look very, very similar. Um, the basic plumage of the male is what we call it when he's not in his breeding plumage. So he's breeding and he has basic. The basic plumage always looks very similar to the female plumage, much more similar at least than his breeding plumage. Newly hatched ones are not covered in feathers. They're covered in down and fluff. They will eventually develop their feathers. And um, when they do, we call it juvenile plumage. It'll then replace the down. And this starts at about two weeks of, um, of age. It continues until they're able to fly. So they have to first replace all of them. So when you see all the cute little ducks swimming around and like their yellow and white plumage, they may not be able to fly yet because they may not have their flight feathers. So that's why so many ducks um, and geese babies are lost to alligators and turtles and snakes. Ours are sometimes lost to the snapping turtles on campus um, because they can't fly away if something's trying to eat them. And they develop these more rigid contour feathers and their flight feathers which help them be able to move. The North American ducks go through at least two body plumages per breeding cycle. So the idea for the males of the basic and the breeding feathers or the basic and the um, alternate. Um, most ducks will have a very dull plumage in their non-breeding season. There's no need to look very attractive if you're not going to get a mate would be kind of the evolutionary drive behind that. So if you're not mating, you don't need to have the expense of having the beautiful feathers, and you also don't want to have that expense of perhaps getting eaten. And we call their non-breeding season colors, uh, yes, their non-breeding season plumage is sometimes called the eclipse plumage. Um, it's dull colored, and they go through this eclipse stage, which is usually before their flight feathers come in. Because how well does a duck survive if it has no flight feathers? Not well, I would assume. If something's after it, it's probably going to get eaten, shot, whatever. So this eclipse plumage is a hiding plumage. And it will do its body plumage then before it does the wings, because if it did the wings first while it was still brightly colored, it makes itself a target. So we see that ducks are one of the groups that do not replace all of their feathers at one point in time. It happens in groups. Um, in the dabblers, the males will start to develop their breeding plumage in the winter so that they have that period of time before they return in the spring to become attractive to the females and to find a mate. So when they're on their wintering grounds, they will switch from the brown colorations back to the bright colorations. There are changes in the female plumage as they change feathers, but they're so slight that we can't really see a difference between females in one season and females in the other. One thing we do know is that females will not molt their flight feathers until they are done nesting and until they have trained their young how to fly. This is incredibly important for them because the females are the ones that are taking care of the babies. So if they haven't taught them how to fly, they risk losing all of their offspring that year. So they put a pause on their flight feathers, whereas the males will actually tend to molt them before the females do. Habitats, I think most of this we already mentioned. So they're found in aquatic areas, but some of them will change habitat with season. This is why some migrate. Others will move up or down mountains. Others will move from wetlands into forests and so forth. So habitats do change seasonally. Sometimes they change with vegetation. Let's say we were in a drought, which, well, we're four inches behind on rain for the last two months in this region. I don't know if you consider that a drought or not, but we have less water than normal. If all of our vegetation started dying off, the birds would leave here. We wouldn't call that a migration. We'd actually call that an eruption when animals move from one area to another based on food availability. So that can happen. Um, but also water characteristics, because you had mentioned, if there's no birds, no water birds in an area of water, what might that tell you about the water? Is it healthy? 
Maybe it has a lot of crocodiles, though, so there could be another reason. But we do see that they will change if water is unhealthy. Um, they do live from fresh to saltwater environments, but young birds uh, will not survive if they drink salt water because the birds that are found in salt water actually have to develop their salt glands. So they tend, even if they can live in saltwater environments, not to have their babies in the extreme salty environments because it puts their lives at risk. Prairies in the Great Plains have been reduced by about 50% in the type that we call the prairie pothole region. These are the prairie areas where there are little streams, there are little ponds, little areas of wetland, um, but this is a problem. Much of that area was filled with water birds. And this is an important area for nesting. So that means that these birds may have lost 50% or more of their nesting areas in the prairie environments, which has led to some massive decreases in this few species. And then of course, different species thrive in different areas. I mentioned um, the idea that a few nest in trees. Harlequin ducks are different. These are the only ducks that will nest next to fast flowing rivers and only next to fast flowing rivers. Most ducks, swans, geese ignore them because if your babies fall in the fast flowing river, they're gone. But for harlequin ducks, it's the only place where they're found. And in areas where they, people have put up a lot of dams and things to slow down water, we've actually seen losses in harlequin ducks. Um, model ducks are found all over the Gulf Coast, so Gulf of Mexico. Wood ducks and hooded mergansers are found in forested wetlands, so we may find them at Heinz. Um, and then you have some that are found in the tundra. Not shockingly, the tundra swan, the snow goose, both the branch and the Canada goose spend a lot of time there. And then the long-tailed duck and some of the eaters, so, or eaters. So there's a lot of groups that are found in different locations. We've mentioned most of them eat plants but the different tribes will eat different types of plants and some tribes also eat animals. So the types of plants they eat, seeds, berries, some will eat potatoes and other types of tuber vegetation, um, foliage, grasses. The ones that live in salt marsh areas may eat salt marsh grass. Um, some will eat sedges and then you have the others that eat a lot of pond weeds. At one point in time, we had less algae and more pondweed on our ponds. That was very, very good for the ducks. They thrived remarkably well. Animal food, almost exclusively invertebrates or fish eggs, um, crustaceans, but there are a few species that will eat fish, but they are your larger ones generally. Your ducks are your omnivores. Keep in mind that the geese and the swans are just herbivores and their food will change depending upon the season. And a few of them are considered agricultural pests, specifically migrating geese. Has anyone, or has everyone maybe, it might be the better question, seen migrating geese? Or seen a group of migrating geese? How many geese would you estimate sometimes migrate together? A lot. Sometimes a lot. Sometimes you see small groups and there might only be like 20 to 50, but some of the snow geese and other species migrate in flocks of thousands to hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And when they land in an agricultural region, they will take over fields. Um, I used to live in Southern Delaware and I remember a couple days driving by what had been cornfields and it looked like the farmer was trying to grow snow geese. You could not see where the corn had been. It was filled with white geese. And there's a problem. If the birds show up before you've done your harvest, you've lost your harvest. So sometimes there are farmers that are trying to figure out how long can I let it grow versus how soon do I need to get it before the geese show up. So they are seen as agricultural pests, um, but you kind of live with it because what are you gonna do to with even a quarter of a million snow geese run. I mean, you can't, you, you can try to drive your tractor towards them, but they're going to get out of your way, but there's still so many of them that it's a huge issue. But in the U.S., we're not really allowed to do anything to them because they're migratory birds and they're protected. 
So you can't put out poison. You can't do anything like that. Um, but some of our migratory birds that spend part of their years in Central and South America are facing massive losses because the agricultural areas there have bird poison in them. So their bills they tend to be specialized for their food type. So if they eat a lot of seeds, their bills are going to have a strong, sharp edge so that they can get into the seeds. If they eat a lot of large vegetation items, they're going to have a larger structure. If they filter feed, they're going to have that lamellae that are going to allow them to filter through the water. So they'll bring in a mouthful of water, push it out, the water leaves, but the lamellae are kind of like the baleen teeth of a whale or the filter feeding apparatus of invertebrates. So it's going to trap in all of the particles and they can then just kind of swallow it. Um, there are a few that have this nail tip. You can sort of see a little bit there and a little bit there where it kind of goes down and there's that small tip. That's really good if you're going to be stripping seeds off of a branch or also if you have large prey items and you need to pull off little pieces of it. A beak like this would not work well for that because you have no grip at the end. Um, but this little nail tip can also be used as defense or if males are fighting over access to a female. Most of these birds, though, have the ability to eat a variety of foods, and some of them, their bills will change slightly if they do alter their food seasonally. It will be a little bit different when they're eating inverts than it is when they eat plant matter. Um, breeding behaviors, gosh, if we were going to do a good job on covering the breeding behaviors of the ducks and geese, we would actually spend most of the semester on them. Thank God we will be finished with them today and not spend an entire semester on how ducks find meats. But pair bonding behaviors vary greatly depending upon the group. The geese and the swans tend to be more similar. The ducks tend to have a larger area of variation. Um, because the ducks form a new pair each year, whereas the swans and the geese tend to stay with that one mate for their entire life or at least until they lose that mate. And then some will not necessarily remate, whereas others will. Um, you've all probably heard that if you hit a Canada goose with your car, maybe you haven't heard this, the other one is going to stand over and look at it. If a Canada goose, I've seen it happen, um, loses its mate if it's hit by a car, if something happens to it and it dies, it stands over it and it protects it and it's mourning for it. It's terrifying to see and also really, really, really sad. Um, I saw this when I was, I don't know, maybe like 10 or 12 and the goose um, was poking its mate. It was trying to pull it up. It was trying to like bring like food and things to it to entice it. And then when it realized that it was gone, it was just like standing there with their equivalent of crying, I imagine honking and making all sorts of tortured noises. Um, but whatever nature preserve we were at, when we got there, it was doing all of this over its mate. And when we left hours later, it was still standing there. And there are numerous cases where swans or geese have starved themselves to death and died while trying to wait for their dead mate, um, which is really sad. And depending upon how you look at it, some people say a great structure for monogamy. Um, I'll leave that choice to you. Um, most people would say, no, you don't stand over your dead mate and wait for them. But there are a few situations where they have remated or found a new mate and moved on. But the ducks, they've got a new boyfriend, girlfriend, we won't call them a mate, every year. It's rare that they tend to mate with the same one. Um, males will follow females to the breeding grounds. They don't always end up at the same breeding ground they started at. So there is mixing of genetics from that. The degree of socialness that we see at the nesting site or between the mated pair and others of its species is totally going to depend on the species. Some are social, some are territorial. Some are territorial of their nest. Others are territorial of their nest and their feeding areas. 
Some are just really territorial of their feeding areas and some don't care at all. And then there's a large spectrum in between. Um, but we believe that the amount of territoriality, especially in species that have individuals that are not territorial and some that are, is entirely related to food availability. If there's a lot of food, it is energetically expensive and unnecessary to be territorial because you will waste a lot of energy when there's a lot of available food. If there is not much available food, it is important to be territorial about your food because that's the only way you can make sure that your babies are going to survive and that you have enough food for them. There are adults that do not breed each year, especially the ones that have just been born the year before. We tend to call them sub-adults and they do not really have any role in reproduction, but they watch the breeding behaviors of the others. They fly with them. They see how do you take care of your young, and they kind of learn for that year um, how to be an adult and how to have babies. For sea ducks, it can take them up to three years to become sexually mature, so they learn a lot about how to take care of young. Um, males will tend to, in this group, stay to help with incubation, and then to help care for the young, but not always. And these birds may lay more than one clutch of eggs, so more than one, if you were thinking of cats or dogs or mice, more than one litter a year. So we call them a clutch of eggs is how we define it for birds. And that's going to be in areas that tend to be warmer. You're going to see more than one clutch because they need that time to take care of the young. So what do their nests look like? Well, it's a couple examples here. The nests tend to be these mounds of vegetarian, vegetation somewhere near the water's edge, especially true of your dabbling ducks, your geese, and swans. But not for everybody. There are a few species that are going to nest over the water, where they're going to have a tree branch nest, or they're going to be nesting on vegetation that hangs out over the water, and some of them on vegetation islands in the water so they may be closer to the water. They tend to conceal their nests well. Part of it is camouflage. It's made with the vegetation that's found nearby, but mostly it's because they're young when they're born, don't have flight feathers. So you need to have some protection for them. The snow geese and the brants and the eater eiders are gonna nest on small islands. Um, some species actually are known for building kind of like a tent structure or a lid structure over their nest so that there provides extra concealment. The pintails and the mallards sometimes nest in agricultural fields because there's a lot of protection when you're surrounded by plants. The islands also can provide protection, but there are a few species that nest differently. The wood ducks and the scoby ducks can nest in trees and nest boxes. So they will nest in a cavity in a tree, a large cavity in a tree. Or with the wood ducks, there are also nest boxes you can build or buy to attract them to your property. So they will nest in trees. This can be problematic because it means in order to get in and out, their young are going to have to jump. So they may not return to the nest once the young leave the nest. Canada geese have been known to nest on rocks, on sides of cliffs, in old eagles' nests, they tend to be less particular about where they nest. Um, golden eyes will nest in ground burrows and in rock crevices, um, so their nests are not very well protected necessarily. And both mallards and Canada geese have been found nesting on tops of beaver dams and beaver lodges on a somewhat regular basis. So some of these birds are very selective, some of these birds are like, that looks like a good place. I'm just going to build a little nest here. Their eggs, all of the eggs in this group are unspotted, so it's a pure color. It's a dull white, a buff, or a pale olive. So their eggs all look fairly similar, but the individual bird may lay slightly different colored eggs, different size eggs, and slightly different colored and slightly different shaped eggs. And the different groups will have different sizes, colors, and shapes. When they start laying eggs, they probably are only going to lay one or two a day at max. So it can take a few days to get your entire clutch. 
they tend to start incubating before the last few are laid. Some species, however, will wait until the last ones are laid so that they all hatch at the same time because hatching time is related to incubation. They practice what's called parasitic egg laying. This is when a bird will lay its eggs in others of its species, in the nests of other species that are nearby, where they just kind of run over, drop an egg in the nest, and kind of go on their way. Having said that, this is the opposite of the cowbird, which we already talked about. They do not come back and kill the other babies. They don't do anything else. Um, it's just kind of like, oh man, I have to lay another egg. I already have a lot. I'm going to go give them one. It also seems to be that females are more likely to do this if the offspring may not be the male that is helping them take care of their nest. There's also another reason they do this. If you have babies in a lot of different nests, even if one nest fails, it's likely that your genetics will continue into the next generation. So there may be an evolutionary reason why this is important. But what this means is that sometimes you find that you have babies that aren't your own in your nest. If a duck comes back to her nest and discovers there are lots of eggs, considerably more than when she left, she may abandon that nest entirely. Because if she's only laid one or two and there's six eggs in there, she's going to be caring for a whole bunch of babies that aren't hers. It's more energetically, it's energetically cheaper to just abandon that nest and start over. Um, from a parental perspective, I'm not sure that would be a good idea, but they're trying to maximize their reproductive output. And it's not clear that they think these things through. This is the way that we've made sense of the evolutionary mechanism. But they can recognize their eggs from other eggs. Sometimes. But Canada geese have been known to incubate ping pong balls and golf balls. So um, if they're a ground dwelling species, their success tends to be low. They might get run over by a person, a car, a dog, a lawnmower, a bike, whatever. So success rate is not always going to be the best, but their young may get eaten too. Renesting is common. Um, that means where they're going to abandon a nest or one nest fails, they're going to try to nest again to be able to have offspring that year. And females will incubate the eggs, but the males sometimes provide defense. So the male is going to keep other males from trying to get to his female so that he can ensure that all the babies in that nest are his. Or he's going to at least defend her and sometimes even bring her food because that way she can do her best job to take care of their offspring. The young do imprint. What's imprinting? So they're going to figure out who their mother is and figure out who others of their group are. And that's how they're going to associate. So they're going to use that information. It's very important information for them. But they can imprint on things that are not their mother or not their nest mates. Um, if they happen to be raised by a human, they may imprint on the human as their mother. There have been instances where they've imprinted on cats and dogs that have found young ducks that have been abandoned. Um, so they may imprint on whatever they find. Most of the clutches in this group are going to hatch within 24 to 36 hours. So all of the young are going to hatch pretty quickly. They're going to imprint on each other as knowing what does something of my group look like. And then the mother and the father, they tend to imprint on so they can follow them. And then they're going to stay together as a group. It increases survival. They do have a heavy down insulation when they're first born, and we consider them precocious. This means that they are born with their eyes open and ready to eat on their own. So um, this is the opposite of what we see with sparrows, which are born in a very immature state, and the parents must come and... Um, provide the food directly to the babies, um, which, does anyone know how sparrows feed their babies? They regurgitate food to them, whereas here in the ducks, the geese, the swans, that's not necessary. The mother or the father, whoever's with them, can go, okay, here's some food, eat, and it works well. So they are able to eat on their own, they can see, they have some level of feathers, 
sparrows, finches, things like that that are born differently don't even have feathers necessarily at birth. So these look like tiny little birds. Some of them will leave the, new, the nest almost immediately after hatching. Some it will take a little bit longer. Some will return to the nest if it's near where they are. Others, once they leave the nest, they never return. The parents will brood them, meaning they will keep them warm by kind of putting their body on over top of them to keep them warm or next to them. And they will protect them, but once again, they're bringing them to the food and saying, please eat, not putting the food directly into their mouths. The amount of time they spend with their parents varies. Um, ruddy ducks, they can abandon their young after a few days. Once they start getting their feathers, they're kind of done. They've taught them everything they need to. And in those species, they develop their flight, their flight feathers much, much faster. And they may already be born with rudimentary flight feathers. Um, in geese and swans, they stay for, well, a long time. It could even be almost most of their life that they're in the same familial groups and flocks. Whistling ducks will stay with their young until the young are able to fly and then they kind of go on their own way. Migration is common in this group. Um, high altitude migration is common because they're moving very long distances. And to move a long distance, it's good to be high altitude because it actually takes you a shorter distance. To move a long distance, it would be at low altitude because you're higher up, you're gonna be traveling faster and longer distances. And some of them are going almost from Canada to portions of um, Central America, uh, maybe even portions of South America. So we see long migration pathways. This is not the longest migrating though. We'll see those with some of the seabirds. They will do a wing molt generally before they migrate. Um, however, some of the females will not do this until after they've migrated if they have offspring that they're trying to take care of and help. And the timing of migration is not as clear with these as it is with some other groups. With some groups, the migration is always at almost the same exact day every year. With these, it varies. It varies by season, by rainfall, availability of food, all these things can trigger migration, but also each species. Some migrate, some don't. Some migrate every year, some migrate some years and not others. And some will migrate during the day, some at night, some at twilight, some in the morning, some in the heat of the day, so the timing of migration is very different. Um, the pochards and the dabbling ducks must fly at night. We believe this gives them protection because they're less likely to be seen, whereas the Canada geese and the snow geese can migrate at any time of the day, but also at night. We have four flyways in the U.S., the Atlantic, the Mississippi, the Central, and the Pacific. They're not as well constrained as this map would like them to be, as you can see. Um, it has these gray arrows, but the dots are where they actually are. But they tend to be four relatively defined regions. And we've done banding studies. There is no guarantee that a bird that migrates over here is going to stay here. It may end up in any of the other migratory paths because it could end up with another group of its species. Um, they tend to have either inland or coastal migratory patterns depending upon the species. But they can also go outside of their migratory paths if there's a climate issue. If there's a storm, sometimes they get stuck or they get trapped. And they will change, if there's a change in their habitat, they will also change their migratory pattern. And then there's just the fact that the individuals move around. Some will not migrate well over water. They will choose only to migrate over land whereas others will do long distance migrations over water. A long distance migration over water is fine, provided you can guarantee you can make it to the land on the other side. Because landing on the water for these guys is not super problematic, but still a lot of birds are not great at migrating over oceans or things like that. Because if you have to stop, there's no guarantee you can find food or a good place to rest. So conservation. Many of these birds have been in decline since the Dust Bowl times. The 1930s, we had a lot of drought in the Midwest, a lot of drought in the prairies, a lot of loss of area, and this led to declines in a lot of species. 
We've really tried very hard to protect their habitats since then, and we've done a relatively good job. Um, we've protected them by doing regulation. There's the Migratory Bird Act, which keeps them safe. It's regulated and basically eliminated the hunting of some migratory birds, but also their egg gathering. You can get permits for duck hunting and goose hunting. You can also get permits for egg, oh gosh, aldering, I believe is what it's called, where you um, can destroy the eggs of pest species. Uh, Eastern holds a permit for egg collection, not collection, um, for egg, for messing with the eggs, we'll just call it that, of, of the Canada geese. Um, and if you really want to get involved in that, um, you certainly can. You can talk to me and I'll figure out who to talk to about that. But we do have a permit that allows us to take so many eggs a year. Um, to keep the population down because we don't want the population to get so large that our campus cannot support it. There's also population management in some areas, which is restricting populations that are growing too much or trying to figure out how to help populations that are struggling. And then there's a lot of public education. People care more now about geese and swans and ducks than they used to. You may not be familiar with groups like ducks.org or Duck Hunters Unlimited or things like this, but they actually may hunt ducks, but they do more work for conservation than you can even imagine because a lot of duck hunting groups have realized the only way that they can still have enough ducks to hunt is if those duck species have enough habitat and high quality habitat. So they help with wetland restoration and all sorts of work like that, which is not what you would expect necessarily of hunters but they do a lot of good. We've shifted from managing for a single species of duck to managing for all waterfowl in areas where we manage for them. This has helped many species to recover. And then we have some little problems with accidental species and escapees. So an accidental species is just a species that's outside of its normal range. Maybe it got lost. Maybe on the wintering grounds it was like, I'm going to follow those birds, and it's in a place where it really doesn't belong. It doesn't tend to be a big problem unless you get a whole bunch of them, which happened with, I believe it's the, it's one of the swan species that's found in the U.S. I don't know if it's the, I, I think it's the mute swan. Now has breeding populations here where it used to not because of accidental species. There's also escapees. These come from captive rearing groups. So this could be some of the swans um, that are not native to this area. And these tend to be reported by people that see them to birding websites, but it doesn't really change much about management. And then for their populations, we've seen in 1986, the North American Waterfowl Management Plan was passed to restore waterfowl populations in North America. Um, not all waterfowl are easy to monitor. Sea ducks spend a lot of time in the ocean on different coastlines. They're pretty secretive. It's very difficult to get good baseline data about them. We do know that in a lot of species, your long-term trends are related to the available quality and quantity of wetlands. If you need wetlands, and there's a lot of wetlands, and there's high quality wetlands, your species will do well. So we track species based on wetland quality. Um, goose are doing really, really well. Some of them, like the Canada goose, are doing too well. And we're now not really sure what to do about that. Um, it's because they've adapted to be in part agricultural pests. So they've found additional food and they've found ways to survive in areas where they used to not be. Swan populations uh, were quite low at one point but they're increasing in part because there are people who like having pet swans. Do any of you, have any of you seen ponds with like a pair of swans? My undergrad had, um, had swans art um, and they had a couple pairs at different points and their swans bred every year and there were people who were on the waiting list to buy the offspring because um, it can be if you have a lot of extra money 
and a property with a large pond, a nice thing apparently to have pet swans. Sometimes people will clip their wings so that they can't fly away. Um, others will not because they don't really want to interfere that much with the swan's life. But there are people that will keep them and breed them. And they're doing a lot of restoration efforts for wetlands, which is helping swans. And this is a swan, and notice its babies are on its back. And it is protecting them and taking care of them. There's a lot of mortality factors for these birds. Um, predation, disease, dying from old age, it can be problematic. The reasons why you see large die-offs are going to vary, though, from year to year. Egg and young predation has been very high especially if there's an area near a dog park where they nest or an area where people let their dogs go. Because dogs come in, they run through the nesting areas, they kill all the eggs. It's very problematic. Botulism has started to become a problem because as wetlands dry up, species of bacteria that can cause botulism effects are going to increase. And then, well, you have a botulism outbreak and you lose them. It's also been diseases, avian corolla, uh, avian coral, hmm. cholera, gosh, sorry. Um, I, I was thinking like chlorine and I couldn't, so avian cholera, um, aspergillus and duck plague are all problematic diseases. And then, of course, you guys have heard of avian flu, which hit chickens. We haven't seen that in ducks or things yet that we're aware of, but diseases are becoming problematic. Plant diseases have been known to reduce food. So if they eat a certain type of plant, especially the seeds of a plant, and that plant becomes infected, the disease then reduces the amount of food available for the ducks. And losses are really high in areas where a lot of them nest in a very concentrated area, because if there's a problem, there's a whole lot of birds to be affected. That's that idea, um, if we look at college students, that those of you that live in the dorms, if somebody comes down with a cold or the flu, are much more likely to get it than the commuting students are, right? Because the commuting students aren't here, so they're outside the population, whereas when you have a concentrated population, if there's a problem, everyone's more likely to be affected. Human impacts, gosh, um, there's a lot of them. I'm not even going to talk about all of them. Um, habitat modification is obvious. We change the habitat. We change whether or not they can survive. And it happens on many, many sites. A stopover site is where these birds are going to stop and eat and then continue migrating. So it's in their migratory path, but it's a place where they stop to get food. Um, Fertilizers and too much sediment in the water is decreasing dissolved oxygen, causing anoxia or hypoxia, and it's leading to death of their food or sometimes um, the overgrowth of dangerous bacteria, which in turn hurts them. Acidification of water areas, making it too acid for them to survive or their, for their food to survive. Lead poisoning, if they eat lead shot, you know, they can have lead poisoning. They've been hunted by farmers. Exotic plants and animals have affected them. And then we have introduced or domesticated bird species or released bird species that have caused problems. Um, I was right. The mute swans from Europe have been problematic. And they have kind of hurt some of the other populations. But recently, we've had a lot of good work with reintroducing the trumpeter swan to the eastern parts of North America where it had been locally extinct or extirpated from. So management, wetland habitat protection, land purchasing by groups that have money, they purchase the land, they protect the geese, the ducks that way. You can band birds, so they put these little plastic bands on them and they then see where they end up when they catch them in other areas. This allows us to know where they are some of the best data is from hunters because when hunters find a kill and take a bird with a band they're almost always going to return that data because they know that knowing more about the population they hunt will allow them to continue to hunt in the long term um, in some areas we've reduced or eliminated hunting seasons especially reduced if the females and the males are going into breeding season because if you hunt 
animals just as they're getting ready to breed. Why is that bad? Less babies. Less to no babies. So the species would suffer and you would suffer. Um, they've also reduced bag limits. So the number that, that uh, hunters can take a year and they've closed off some areas to hunting, especially if it's near the nest so that you don't kill a mother bird as she's at the nest. And there are 500 national wildlife refuges that are operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're going to be going to two of them this semester. That's a lot of refuges, and almost all of them support birds of some type or another. So the Labrador duck, I told you we'd come back to him. The Labrador duck was last seen in New York State in 1878. We knew it was relatively always rare. There was never in recorded human history a lot of them. We really don't know why it went extinct. All we know is that it did. And the fact that a bird species went extinct and we couldn't figure out why is why a lot of people got interested in conservation of animals. And the Labrador duck is this duck here. It's a relatively large duck. It's kind of like a goose-sized duck. This is something that you would know went missing from your system. Um, we've also seen a lot of other species um, suffer, but some we've been able to kind of help. One that we've been able to work really well with is the Aleutian Canada goose, which is a subspecies of the Canada goose. It um, lives on the Aleutian Islands but it, it had been endangered. Uh, there were foxes introduced to the islands. And then in 2001, we removed it from the endangered species list because our breeding programs for it had worked so well. So you need to know we have had success. But the um, Stellar's eater, or eater and the Spectacled Eater are both threatened. We've seen declines. Um, mostly, we don't know why. With the Stellar's, the variety of reasons include everything from lead shot poisoning to predation by foxes, to hunting them for food, um, to impaired water quality, and then um, flying into towers, apparently, has been a massive area of mortality for them. But really what's happening, we've now discovered, is their habitat is shrinking. So when you include habitat shrinking with the rest of these, you have a big problem. Having said that, we've tried to fix the habitat thing, and that's not helping. Hence why we still say the reason for that one is kind of unclear or unknown. With the spectacled, um, it has a pretty restricted habitat anyway, so we don't think that's that. Lead shot's not helping. Predators aren't helping. Contaminated water's not helping. But there's nothing that they can directly link to its decline. The big concern for the spectacled is that it has a small habitat and climate change could very well push this bird from endangered to extinct. There are a lot of species we have that are on watch lists. Watch lists are those that are not necessarily qualifying for endangered species, but they're species that we need to be concerned about. Emperor goose. It is having a lot of problems with hunting and oil pollution in the areas where it's found. It has a relatively small range as well, so climate change could be problematic. The trumpeter swan, um, it should be on the endangered species list if you exclude everything except for the population in Alaska. Alaska is doing well. Everywhere else, it's horrible. The branch um, goose actually has the opposite problem of everybody else. Since the 1980s, it's increased by tenfold, which means there's 10 times as many of them as there were in the 1980s. We're now concerned that there's too many of them for, this, for its areas to support. The model duck has been replaced by mallards. It's also hybridizing really well with mallards and it's losing its own species. In Florida, the species that's there lives in the Everglades and has lost a lot of its area. Um, the harlequin duck and the black duck have been hunted, but in the harlequin duck, more than half of its population lives in one area in Maine. If it loses that area or there's a problem in that area, half the species is gone. So we're also seeing subspecies declines, but our biggest problem perhaps in management of these birds is there are species we don't know well. If you don't know a species well, you can't manage it, period. If there's no data, you have nothing to compare to. And for ducks and geese and swans, they're big. 
So these are big species we don't know well. So start thinking ahead about sparrows and tiny birds that we don't even see when we see them sometimes. So that should give you an idea for those birds of how little we may know about them. And we're done with ducks and the swans and the geese. Yay! So we're going to do loons because they're awesome. Then we're going to watch a couple video clips. And this is a common loon, adult, with its baby next to it. And this is going to be the red-throated loon. So these are two loons that are common in this area. This is the order Gaviformes, family Gavidae. They have a daggered-like bill. So it's going to be pointed, and it's going to have a sharp point to it. What do you think they eat with a dagger-like bill? Fish. Fish. Animal food. So they use it home to feed. They have a short neck. Very long wings, and their legs are set very far back on the body, kind of like almost under their butt. Their calls are described as haunting whales. These are frequently the calls that you will hear from birds in a movie when it's sunrise or sunset or night over a pond, and you hear that bird call. It's almost always a loon. They have very elaborate mating displays um, that we will see in one of the videos and they will winter in our coast in our local coastal winters so you may get to see one of these birds both species are facing declines as are other loons worldwide um they're an ancient bird lineage at least um 20 million years old of uh, the birds that are like the modern loons so this is a really old bird line there are loon-like bird fossils from 70 million years ago, though. So pretty ancient. Um, because of this, in part, its relationship to all of the other birds is really not clear. It's separated a long time ago. So it gives us a hard time putting them back into the family tree. The common loon and the yellow-billed loon have super species. Um, this is the idea that instead of having like subspecies under a species, that we have larger groups that are probably related species that could kind of go together. Birds, because I forgot to mention this last time we talked about taxonomy, have a lot of taxonomic groups that don't exist in anything else. Um, there's also the Arctic and the Pacific loon. The red-throated loon is very distinctive. A lot of the other loons look like this, but the red-throated loon has that bright red and a lot of gray to it. Interestingly enough, these loons survived what's called the KT boundary between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary, part of the area where we see the last of the dinosaur-like creatures. When they forage, they swim, they dive really, really well. They will hunt fish and they can dive up to 250 feet deep and their dives can last almost 45 seconds. So these are birds that are very well adapted for water life. They do need relatively clear water to hunt because they hunt by sight. We do know if they only have access to muddy water, they will actually hunt by feel. So they will feel into the water and then go after something. But if they have clear water, they're incredibly good hunters. And this one here has its head down, looking into the water so that it'll be ready to dive immediately when it sees its food item. They eat a lot of food because they're really large birds and they live in cold climates, so they need a lot of energy. Um, a pair, so two adults, with their young can eat over a ton, so over 2,000 pounds of fish during one breeding season. So you need a large fish supply in order to support these birds. If you have an area that has seen loss in the fish supply, these birds will be impacted. Um, they also eat pebbles, and they store the pebble, pebbles in their gizzard. Why might they eat pebbles? What do they not have that we have? They don't have teeth, and they also don't have hands. So they can't use utensils, and they can't chew their food, which means they swallow it, and they eat fish, and they eat crustaceans. They need to crush it you know, crush down the bones and the hard parts. So having the pebbles in their gizzard kind of acts like teeth, and it's gonna crush and pulverize the food so that it can pass through the digestive tract without injuring them. 
Has anybody here ever swallowed a fish bone? No? Did it hurt? So imagine that with every bite of food that you have. Or for those of you that haven't, just think of the idea of bones going down your throat as you swallow everything. So this is going to keep them from having to worry about that. It protects them. Um, their body is strangely adapted for their lifestyle. Their legs and their feet are way, way back on the body. This is why they're such good divers, because their legs have very great propulsion. Their body is very long in front of the legs. So they can become very streamlined and they have very little drag in the water. So there's very little friction between them and the water when they do dive. But because of this, they do not walk well at all. Um, so imagine for a moment, we'll think of like a dog. So, or, or well, here, here's their body shape. So if this is the body shape, generally you would want the legs kind of in the middle, right? Because that supports the body and you can walk well. Imagine they only had one set of legs since all the way back here. Or imagine a dog with only its set of back legs. That's kind of like the loon trying to walk on land. You're trying to balance everything on your back legs. And for them, almost all of their bodies in front of it. So um, some of them are really problematic walkers and actually don't walk. They kind of push their chest forward and pull their feet up with it. It's entertaining. Um, they have flattened tarsi, so a flattened structure structured with the feet. So it's webbed, but all of this is going to be very flat. So the legs have no obvious ankle, um, no obvious bones sticking out. It helps reduce drag. They have great underwater vision, that dagger-like bill. Their bones are dense and their plumage is dense. Why would a dense bone help a bird? Because normally their bones are very light. Why might that help? helps with diving. If you're too light, it's hard to dive quickly deep distances. So having dense bones really assists with diving. And the dense plumage is because they're found in cold areas. So it keeps them warm and it also waterproofs them. Um, like I mentioned, they have some very significant problems walking on land. So their feet are all the way back here. And when they try to walk, that's a lot of body in front of the feet. Um, it actually, um, some birders have described their walking as almost impossible, like they should not be able to walk. Large loons, though, have an even bigger problem. They can't take flight from being on land because they can't run in order to take flight at all. So they actually need to be on a large stretch of water to take flight because they can't beat their wings enough to move them off of land. Um, what makes them really great for water makes them really horrible on land. And there have been a number of instances where loons have been stranded on very small islands and they have been unable to take off. Um, and they may die actually if they get stranded too far from a water body. Or if they're in such a small yeah. water body, there's not enough area for them to take off. They usually mean a large, um, what we call water runway, so a runway um, in order to take off. For nesting, um, they nest in undisturbed lakes. They like in a lot of area without any interruptions whatsoever. Some of them on open water, because as I mentioned, they need that runway. Um, and small loons nest on ponds, but they tend to forage elsewhere. So they may nest in one area, but feed elsewhere. This is so they have an area where they can take off from easily. And rivers, lakes, ponds, and coastal areas can all be called home by the loons. For nesting, they have synchronous displays, meaning that the male and the female will be doing the same behavior. We believe this helps build their pair bond, and it also helps build communication between them. They will build false nests. These are nests that are built exactly like their nest, but they do not lay any eggs in it. This will keep the predators from being able to find out what nest they have their eggs in. Um, almost all of their calls happen during their breeding season. And they can call at other times, but almost all of them are when they're in the breeding time. Males are territorial and make these loud calls. In the red loon, the females will vocalize, and a lot of the other loons, we don't see this. 
for the females. And when a um, when a visitor, so another male or female that's not part of a breeding ground breeding pair shows up on their breeding grounds, they will chase it off. But we've discovered that a lot of their courtship behaviors also resemble their aggressive behaviors. We see this in a lot of birds. And um, from an evolutionary perspective, that's a bit scary because you wouldn't want to be aggressive with an animal you were trying to court necessarily. But in birds, we see that this is true. So territorial behaviors and courtship behaviors frequently look similar. Um, when they are doing their breeding behaviors, they will chase each other through the sky. They will dive at each other in the air. They will swim together. They will lower their bills at each other. Um, and the female, if she likes the male, will then um, initiate um, with him that she would like to mate with him by presenting herself to him. Once they're not breeding, they're not territorial at all. They'll just hang out in a large group very happily. But when they're breeding, they need the area for their young and their young only. They build mounds of vegetation in their very weird nests. And if you're really bad at art and you want to build a loon nest, that would work. It's just a pile of stuff. It's one to five inches high. They tend to return to their former nest sites and they can totally reuse them. Other birds will not. They don't mind. It was a good site before. It might be a good site again. They lay anywhere from one to three eggs. They will brood with them for one to three days at the nest. Then when the young hatch, the young, as you can see here, will either swim or ride on the back of their parents. It's very cute. They will take care of their young. They will keep them out of the water. They will give them a safe place, a warm place to be. And the young are born with down and then eventually develop their feathers. They will winter in the coastal waters um, as south as central Mexico. Some of them will winter here. It's south enough that they can survive with the warmth that we have here over our winter. We know they migrate over land, and that's about it. These are not like the ducks and geese. We do not have flyways. We don't know what they do. They molt on the wintering grounds because unlike the ducks who are flightless for a little bit, when these guys are flightless, when they're molting, it's a couple weeks to several weeks at a time. So they will only do this on their wintering grounds because their wintering grounds have a lot of access to food and they're warm enough and they don't have to leave. So if they were to do their molting at another point in time, they may not survive the winter. They're having some problems. Um, no species is endangered, thankfully. Um, but they've done a lot of habitat loss because they live in wetland areas and your ponds, and we have disturbed them a lot by building our multi-billion, multi-million dollar houses all around ponds and landscaping our yards and getting rid of trees, and it's bad. For those that live in some lakes, especially in upstate New York, acid rain and acidification has destroyed the food webs. And there's not enough shellfish, not enough fish for them to live in those areas anymore. So we are seeing they're having to spread out. Industrial pollutants, including mercury, have been found in the bodies of loons. Some of them have eaten the lead sinks that are used at the bottom of fishing lines, um, and they've ended up with lead poisoning from it. And some of them get entangled in fishing gear because they dive a lot. But one of their bigger problems has been oil spills because almost entirely, it seems, when loons get stuck in an oil spill, it's during their molting season. So they can't fly and they can't get away. And if they get stuck in an oil spill, it's basically going to be deadly unless they can be taken in and the oil dealt with. Super fast, the limkin. Um, Medium-sized, dark brown bird, heavily spotted, white spots, long legs, long beak, does not fly unless absolutely necessary. Likes to run, likes to walk, does not do so remarkably well, hence the name Limpkin. It looks like it's limping. You will hear it more likely than see it if you get lucky at all. It lives in freshwater wetlands and worldwide there is one species with four subspecies and we have him. Taxonomy wise, this is between the rails and the cranes. He may look superficially like a heron, but is not related to them. The limpkin eats one thing and one thing only. It eats apple snails, period, end of sentence. 
Um, it may eat some other things, but the thing that it lives in almost entirely on is the apple snail. And when there's a lot of apple snails around, limpkins actually eat two to three of them per minute. Their beak is specially fastened to actually get the apple snail out of its shell. Um, they will lay their eggs on top of water, uh, of vegetation near the water's edge. They can swim, and they tend to do so in shallow water. They'll swim before they'll fly. They're solitary feeders, and when they feed, it's entirely by touch. Did I hit a snail shell? If so, I eat it. If it was not a snail shell, I move on. And their bill can remove a snail from its shell in less than 20 seconds, which is very remarkable, especially if any of you have ever tried to remove a snail from its shell. Um, they're territorial birds, territorial because of their food supply. And if they live in a good area, they may actually be territorial year round as opposed to just during breeding times. They do have a courtship ritual in which um, the male and it's not. The male and the female um, will be together. They will be feeding together. And the male will go out and he will find an apple snail and he will bring it to the female and he will give it to her. If she takes the apple snail from him, she is um, basically saying, why, well, yes, I would love to have babies with you. If she does not, she will go find another male. Because if he can provide her with food, the assumption would be that he can also provide their babies with food and that her babies she has with him will be good hunters. Um, they build saucer-shaped nests. They're very weird looking. They're up to two feet across. Sometimes they're on the ground. Sometimes they're in trees. Um, made of all of that. And they also build what's called a brooding platform before the eggs hatch. This is an area next to the nest where they will take care of the young. It also helps with nest sanitation so that the young are not staying in their poop all of the time. And for the last thing for this, um, well, they've had some problems. There are some local areas where they've been extinct. Um, Florida in the early 1900s, we were killing it because it's a pretty easy target if you can find it. Habitat destruction has been an issue. And um, well, there's one massive conservation concern. If we lose the apple snails, we lose the limpkin. And the limpkin are not the only birds that we will talk about that eat the apple snails. Okay, there's a bunch of videos. We're only gonna watch a couple because we only have a couple minutes, but watch them. If you guys find videos you like of birds and you think the rest of us need to see, you can um, post them on Brightspace. You can email them to me, you can email them to each other. What you'll discover is YouTube is full of lots of crazy people with lots of crazy bird videos.